Just how much of an upgrade is the brand new Sony a7 IV versus the Sony a7 III? Well, I found about 50 things. Let's chop, chop, and get right into it. By the way, this helpful video is brought to you by Squarespace. Let's start off with cosmetics and ergonomics first. Number one. The big front emblem has now been changed to simply A7 without the Roman numeral, and the small emblem has been moved to the top left of the body, making the distinction between models cohesive in design across the current generation of alpha cameras. Number two, when you're picking up the camera for the first time, it's gonna feel a little different from the a7 III. The grip size has been increased, so if you're feeling like the a7 III was a little too skinny to grip, the IV should feel a little more comfortable now. But don't worry, the camera did not get any heavier. The a7 IV is 669 grams, and the a7 III is 656 gram. Literally a 13 gram difference. Number three, the analog buttons on the camera now feels a lot squishier. It actually feels like you're pushing buttons rather than tapping on a button. Speaking of buttons, the record button and the C1 buttons have swapped places. Now this is done so because a lot of shooters program their C1 buttons on previous generation cameras to movie record. But if you don't like it that way, you can always reprogram either of these buttons to whatever you like. Number four, one obvious change is the double decker mode dial, which simplifies the amount of turns you need to get into a certain mode. The bottom wheel is a switch between a different capture modes and the top wheel toggles to different exposure settings. We also now have three memory recall slots as opposed to two, which means an additional batch of custom settings you can save to the camera. Another thing that you'll notice is the lack of number markings on the EV dial. And that's because you can actually reprogram the EV dial to do something else, which is handy if you've never bothered with controlling your exposure with the EV dial before. Number five. Moving on, let's talk about port doors, which actually feels like sturdier doors compared to the flimsy dangling ones from the a7 III. The battery door removal is slightly different on this one where the release is closer to the hinge. You'll also notice there's no hole on the battery door that would normally allow for a cable of a dummy battery to pass through. Number six. You can now program the camera to close its shutter when it's powered off. It's one of the more requested features by the community to help prevent dust from entering the sensor. However, please refrain from touching the shutter with your finger to prevent any damages. Number seven. Now this one is more for the vloggers, but the strap rings aren't too loose, so you won't hear too much of the clingy clangs when you're flip-flopping the camera around. Number eight, let's talk memory. There's a flip in memory slots where slot one is now at the top and slot two is now at the bottom. You know, the proper way. The a7 IV supports CF Express Type A cards, but only in slot one. Now, this is gonna be a very, very small deal, but the A7 IV no longer supports the Sony memory stick, which for the longest time, the Alpha cameras did have to support, but I don't think a majority of the users out there actually use a Sony memory stick. Feel free to prove Jason Vong wrong in the comments down below. Number nine. Now, there are a couple of things that are hard to tell. The a7 IV has a slight change in internal design to allow for better heat dissipation, which helps for long form video recording. There's also a slight improvement on the IBIS as well, from five step to 5.5 step. But we'll move on to something a little more obvious. Number 10. The EVF has a resolution upgrade from 2.36 million dot to 3.68 million dot. And that just means things will look a lot clearer. And the back of the LCD screen also got a bump from 921,600 dots to 1.03 million dot. And you can actually see the difference in color reproduction. It's far more accurate on the a7 IV. It's also much easier to tell if things are in focus with the higher res LCD screen. Number 11, but speaking of LCD, probably the biggest and the most requested change is getting a fully articulating flip out screen, which the a7 IV has, but that's not all. It is now a touch navigated display, meaning you can actually use your finger to tap and go through the menu system. Whereas before the touch on the a7 III was kind of limited to just moving the focus point around and maybe double tapping the zoom. Number 13, while we're here, let's talk about the user interface. Now you might've noticed we have the new updated menu system. So things are gonna be a lot more organized compared to before. Number 14, the more exciting update to this is that all the settings from photo mode and video mode can be separated. Now before we could only change what the custom buttons do in each mode, but now we can have different sets of quick function menus and we can have the changes in the setting that we make in video mode to not affect the settings in photo mode. 
So for example, I can be shooting in S Log 3 ISO 800 crop mode for video and then go to photo mode and be in no picture profile, auto ISO, and in full frame for photos. Now it's not a memory recall feature because I can make any of these changes right now and flip flop over and come back to my last saved settings. Hybrid shooters, finally, am I right? Number 15. And the beauty to all of this is that you can save your settings and load it onto another A7 IV, which also means you can have a different settings profile if there will be another shooter using your camera. Number 16. Okay, so here's something that's pretty cool. We have an accessibility section with a screen reader option where the camera can read a part of the menu that you've highlighted. Screen reader on button. Delete button display guide. Menu button back. Speed. Standard. Now I've never seen something like this before and I think it's pretty neat that they've included it in case the user needs a function like this. And hey, maybe in the future they could also include a way to make the text size bigger on the camera. That would be pretty handy. Number 17. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to file management and organization. Big update to video file names. You can now change to C at the beginning of every video file to whatever you like. And you have a choice to put the date in front of that as well. But if you don't mind the C and just hate the fact that the series of numbers keep resetting back to one, it will now continue the sequential order even if you change SD cards. Moving on, we have a few minor quality of life features for finding images and videos in camera. Number 18, because we have a higher resolution display, you can now view up to 30 files on playback at the same time. And if you're cycling through images, you can actually set each of the dial here to jump differently, either one by one, 10 or 100 images at a time, or even based on time itself. Something that was shot maybe three minutes ago, five minutes ago, one hour ago, up to 24 hours ago. There might be a specific use case scenario for that, but the one that I'm more excited about is the ability to skip to the next rated image instead of fumbling through a bunch of unrated ones again. Number 19. You can also now add a divider frame for photos, which you press a button and it will generate an arrow JPEG. This doesn't actually work the way that I thought it would. I thought I could put a divider frame in between the photos I've already shot, but you can't do that. It has to be placed before you take your next photo. A little bit odd for me, but I think I could see how this could be handy to some users. Number 20, this next one is more exciting for videos. We can now add scene markers, which are essentially ins and out points in camera. This puts a metadata in the video where it can be read by Sony's Catalyst Browse, so your editor can quickly find a portion of usable takes right away. However, the marker metadata can only be read in Catalyst Browse. It is unclear if the more common NLE editing softwares will support this in the future, but I'm crossing my fingers here. Number 21, we now have better wireless transfer functions. Whether you're doing it through FTP, Bluetooth, or Wi-Fi, we can now do bulk transfers of photos and videos much easier. We can choose to send only photos, only videos, only rated images, or even mix and match, which is really handy for quick phone to social media posts. Oh, and speaking of wireless features, NFC is no longer a thing on the A7 IV. Now, before we dive into the specific upgrades and differences for photography and videography, we're gonna go ahead and cover the more general stuff that affects both of those mediums. Number 23. There has been an increase from 693 to 759 phase detection autofocus points, which just means more screen coverage of autofocus points spread out. Number 24. Now, real-time tracking autofocus is not a new concept, but unfortunately, when it was introduced, the A7III's processor was a bit too old to receive that as an update, which means we didn't get touch tracking autofocus and no real-time eye autofocus tracking. But you guessed it, the a7 IV can do all of that now in both photo mode and in video mode. And you know what else can be done in both photo mode and video mode? Animal and bird eye autofocus. So before, animal eye autofocus was a photo exclusive thing only, and it will be for the older cameras. But for the a7 IV and on, it will be available in video mode as well. 
number 26. Now, a couple of minor quality of life focus feature improvements that are now available. Because we have real-time eye autofocus, we can now choose which eye the camera should focus on, which is handy if there's a side that your model favors more. You can change the color of your focus box too, between white or red now. You can also limit the amount of focus options available to you, especially for the ones that you don't really need. For example, if you've never bothered with zone autofocus before, you can just take that off your list. Or if you plan on never shooting birds, you can just unlist that from your options. Number 27, soft skin effect makes its return to the Alpha series. Similar to the ZV series, you now have a choice of low, medium, or high skin softening. Number 28, overall colors have been improved as well. As with every iteration, you should find the colors on the A7 IV to match up a bit better with the A7S III and the A1. Number 29, speaking of colors, we now have way more control in our creative looks profile. In addition to having a more expansive control over contrast, sharpness, and saturation, we can now control the highlight, the shadow, fade, and clarity as well. Number 30, and yes, we have the elusive, PP11 Cinetone Picture Profile. Wow, I guess it's not that elusive anymore now that's available on the A7 IV, but for more cinematic expression, choose this profile. Number 31. For S-Log3 shooters, here's a quick update. The native ISO is still 800, but you can use a lower ISO now for S-Log3, but at the cost of your dynamic range. All right, now let's get into the specifics now. Number 32. In the photo department, we got a big bump in megapixels from 24 to 33 megapixel in full frame, and we're going from 10 megapixels to 15 megapixels in super 35 APS-C mode. Number 33. We also have some extra new file formats available for photography. We have the new Lossless Compress RAW, which is a great middle ground between uncompressed and compressed RAW. For non-RAWs, you have a choice between JPEG or HEIF, which stands for High Efficiency High Efficiency High Efficiency Image Format, which are smaller file sizes and sometimes slightly better quality than JPEGs. But if you still want small JPEGs with your RAWs, there is the light JPEG option. New photo aspect ratios have now been added. We now have 4x3 and 1x1. One one. Number 34. There are now different shutter type that you can use on the A7 IV. Similar to the A1 and the A9, you can shoot mechanical like you're used to on the 3, or now with the electronic shutter as well. Number 35. The Sony A7 IV is still capable of shooting 10 frames per second, but the buffer size has increased. You can now do 828 continuous uncompressed RAW with JPEG, so long as you're shooting with a really fast card, aka the CF Express Type A card. But either way, you can let the images write to your card and you can still cycle through your menu while that's happening at the same time. All right, so now for video. Number 36. So while the A7IV's highest resolution is still 4K, it is now oversampling from 7K in full frame mode as opposed to 6K oversampling on the A7III. So you're getting better 4K video quality. In Super 35 mode, we're getting 4.6K oversampling, so still really high quality 4K if you choose to crop in for that extra reach or simply using APS-C lenses. Number 37. Now, the Sony a7 IV can shoot 4K 60p. However, it's only limited to super 35 mode. You cannot use 4K 60 in full frame mode, which is a slight bummer. You can still use full frame lenses, but you're gonna get hit with that one and a half times crop. So if you're using 4K 60 for purely slow motion, hey, it may not be a bad thing because slow motion tends to look a lot better with a closer framing anyways. Number 38. Moving on, we have some new recording formats. The A7 IV, to my surprise, is capable of shooting 10-bit 422. So really good news for people who enjoy color grading because this camera has 15 plus stops of dynamic range. So shooting with S-Log3 just became a lot more viable. We're gonna see stuff like less banding in the sky now. And if you're a quality fiend, this camera can shoot all intra 4K up to 600 megabits per second through the XAVC SI codec. And for this, you might want to consider the CF Express Type A card that we talked about earlier, or just getting a really fast SD card, V90 or higher. But if you enjoy a more efficient codec, the Sony A7 IV does support H.265 10-bit 422 recording, retaining all that high quality goodness in a relatively lower file size. Number 39. 
And because we have 10 bit 422, shooting in slow and quick, S and Q, has also become a lot more viable. Through this mode, we can shoot in playback slow motion in real time with no audio recorded, of course. On the a7 III before, we were capped between 12 to 16 megabits per second, whereas now we have a whopping 100 megabits per second. Number 40. We now have more option for 1080p HD proxy video recordings as well. If you choose to record proxy videos along with your 4K, you can choose H.264 8-bit or H.265 up to 10-bit 420. Number 41. The Sony a7 IV has active stabilization, which crops in 10% into your footage in exchange for less shakier footage. However, this works best with Sony lenses only. Number 42. We also now have the flexible exposure feature similar to the FX3 for video recording if you choose to have some type of automated exposure but with more control on the fly as opposed to trying to shoot in either PASM modes which are traditionally more photo oriented modes which requires you to go back to the menu each time if you want one of the three exposure methods automated. Number 43. Now, because a lot of the Sony mirrorless lenses are designed for photography first, video second, some lenses will produce focus breathing that is not appealing to video shooters. To compensate for that, Sony has included focus breathing correction in the lens compensation section, which will automatically account for breathing. It will crop into the footage to minimize the noticeability of breathing when focus racking back and forth. Again, this works best with compatible Sony lenses. Number 44. Now, because we have real-time tracking autofocus, we have continuous eye autofocus in video mode. And, 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 wait for it. You won't lose face and eye autofocus when you connect to an external monitor or recorder when recording in 4K. And the back of the LCD screen won't black out either. And on top of that, you won't lose the grid lines or marker display on the LCD either, which thank goodness, I like to use the back LCD for framing purposes and the external monitor for focus checking purposes. Number 45. We also have better autofocus speed and sensitivity control, which we can now choose between one to five or one to seven, as opposed to the vague, slow, normal, fast, whatever those mean. Number 46. Focus mapping, which looks like you're detecting heat waves, but actually it's a new way, for alpha users at least, to check focus. Now, unlike peaking where there are just dots everywhere on the screen that tells you what's in focus, how focus mapping works is whatever is not covered by the color squares is where your shot is in focus. Pretty neat, huh? Anything blue is behind depth of field and anything red is in front of depth of field. And in case you're wondering, this only works in video mode. <laughs> Number 47. Now, it was very unfortunate even with the latest updates, a 30-minute recording limit was never lifted from the a7 III. However, the a7 IV does not have a recording limit. You can pretty much record until your card fills up or until the battery dies. Number 48. The Sony a7 IV can also record gyro metadata now, which you can throw your footage into Sony Callus Browse for better post stabilization. This only works best when you have IBIS turned off and you're shooting at a slightly faster shutter speed. Oh, and this metadata can only be read and stabilized in Catalyst Browse. Number 49. In terms of audio, we can actually record up to four channels of audio if you're using a compatible audio interface. The a7 IV has the updated multi-interface hot shoe tech, so it supports any of the wireless Sony mics through digital signals like the BCM-E1M. You can still use this mic on the a7 III, but only in analog setting. Number 50. And finally, live streaming. You can directly hook up the Sony a7 IV to a computer as a webcam without any additional devices. You can stream up to 4K at 15 frames per second or 1080p up to 60 frames per second, but you will need a USB 3.2 port and cable to access the higher resolution. On top of that, you can simultaneously record while you're live streaming as well. I'm sure there are a few other things that I've missed. Let me know in the comments down below what they are. Guys, thank you so much for watching. If you guys enjoy this video and want to support the channel, the best thing that you can do for me is give this video a like and stick around and listen to what my sponsor Squarespace has to say. Vivian and I always strive to bring you guys the best and most unique image and video samples whenever we talk about cameras and lenses. And oftentimes we have high production costs to make this all happen. It's sponsors like Squarespace that help funds our production budget so we can keep bringing you guys more high quality samples. So the best way to support us and to help us continue to do what we do is to simply check out how Squarespace can help you. 
Link down below. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to create beautiful websites. No coding knowledge whatsoever. Perfect for people like me because I just want to make YouTube videos for you guys and not have to worry about coding my entire website. Simply just select one of their templates to get started. Every aspect is easily customizable with their drag and drop feature. Whether you're in need of a portfolio, an e-commerce store, or even a simple blog, design it with Squarespace. Use my link down below to test it out. And when you're ready to launch your first website or domain, use my code Jason Vong to save 10% off. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.